thank you very much. Can you hear me, or can you hear me in the back? So th thank you, Giovanni, and the other organizers for the invitation. I have never been here, and uh, it promises to be a very interesting uh, week for me. Um, I would like to ask you, I feel completely sleepy and jet lagged, so please, if you have any questions, interrupt me, yell at me, do something so that I notice you even if I'm looking at the blackboard, and I really mean it, just, just, just shout at me and then one of us will get you a microphone or I will repeat your question, but just don't let me go on if you have any questions because it will be better for all of us. So. So I wanted to start with a, with, a, with a simple example which will illustrate a lot of the things that I want to subsequently explain, and that's KK biomixing. So this is, uh, if, if you don't know what a K meson is, it's a neutral particle, and I'll get to the a little bit later. What I want to emphasize is that there is, so there are two particles, their mass difference is measured experimentally, to be something like 3.4 times 10 to the minus 15 GeV. And you might ask, where on earth does 10 to the minus 15 GeV come from in a problem that somehow relates to weak interactions? The typical sc scale of weak interactions is 100 GeV. This is a particle whose mass is 500 MeV. So how do you get to 10 to the minus 15 out of, there's, there's nothing apparent here which gives you such an incredibly small scale. So how does the standard model do this, and how can new physics not violate such a constraint which looks like, you know, like 15 orders of magnitude smaller than the typical mass scale in this problem? And of course, for those of you who have studied weak interactions, you know that in the standard model, which I will just denote by SM, this is coming from what's called a box diagram. So this is an S quark. These are W bosons. And if you look at the standard model calculation of this quantity, so this is the experimental value, then you get some expression which goes like the weak coupling to the 4s power because there are four vertices. There are some CKM elements, which I will define you later. If you know what they are, then you know what I'm talking about. And if not, then I'll, 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 I'll explain it in, in, in probably 15 minutes. It's coming from a loop diagram. So there is a 1 over 16 pi square. There are other terms which are important. There is the charm quark mass over MW to the fourth power. And there is some other. Yet other quantities which are denoted by the K on decay constant, some other letter which uh, forget about back parameters. The, so there's the K on mass which enters, and some other things which are order one quantities, and are completely unimportant for this discussion. So, so you see that, that the standard model gets to this 10 to the minus 15 by having 16 pi square, which is a factor of 100. You know, MW is for all practical purposes, purposes 10 to the 2 GeV, so this is 10 to the 8. M chime is 1 over 1 and a half. The CKM elements give you some suppression. G square, G2 to the 4 gives you some suppression. The K on the K constant is something like 150 MeV, and this is like half a GeV. So you get a lot of factors together. So there are loop effects. There are these CKM factors. Uh, sometimes people call this the gym mechanism, the glacial iliopolis myoni mechanism, which in many of these processes gives you some light quark mass suppression. And, and all the hadronic physics, like, you know, how does this diagram, what, what is the, I mean, ultimately, you're asking what is the matrix element of this guy between K mesons? And all that hadronic physics comes into some matrix element, which you know, I can't calculate for you. Lattice QCD people can. But it is, again, you know what is the characteristic scale of that. And, and, and we are not going to worry about order one factors. Now, what happens in, 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 in new physics scenarios, and we'll get back to this in the last lecture in some more details. So if you have some new physics, let's just hypothetically assume that there is some particle which can 
have an S quark and a D quark coupling with some coupling strengths G to some particle X and make So from SD by, make a DS by. And if you work out what is, you know, X is presumably some very heavy particle, G is some effective coupling, which uh, we'll talk about whether it's order one or order 10 to the minus three. So you work out what is delta MK in some random new physics model divided by the experimental value. And you get again that so this G is a different G than the G2. So you get G square from two couplings. There is suddenly a one over MX square, because this is some heavy particle that propagates there. Again, we have to calculate this matrix element, which will go some hadronic physics scale, lambda QCD to the cube, uh, times delta MK, the experimental measured value. And so uh, point number one, throughout my lectures, lambda QCD will not necessarily mean the same quantity as in Michelangelo's lecture, which is strictly the QCD uh, scale at the, in, in the beta function. For me, lambda QCD is some typical hadronic interaction scale. Take half a GeV, or like the rho meson mass, which is 700 MeV. Some, some typical QCD scale, and not necessarily the, 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 the same symbol that people sometimes write in the beta function. And what this tells you is that if this new physics is not to violate this experimental bound, then you find that Mx has to be greater than G times something like 2 times 10 to the 3 TeV. So you say, OK, what is happening? This is really a huge scale. And you see that if you abandon all these particular suppression mechanisms that exist in the standard model, then you get some very large scale that has to suppress such a process. And of course, you may ask, no, I don't know anything about physics at the 10 to the 3 TeV scale. Maybe there is no such particle, but in many of the common TeV scale new physics models, you can generate this coupling G at one loop. So even in, 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 in low energy supersymmetry, you could imagine contributions that G is not order one, but order one over 16 pi square. And you see that even if you plug in G equals 10 to the minus two or 10 to the minus three, then you are still probing physics at the TeV scale. And, and, and that's really sort of generic, that these kind of couplings can occur in most beyond standard model scenarios at one loop level. So, so there are lots of things that, 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 that this example illustrates. And before I say that, I, sh I should say one more thing, that, that all of this has been known since the 70s, actually since the 60s. So for example, for a new physics model building, if some new physics scenario gave a large contribution to delta MK that violated the experimental measurement, this measurement has an uncertainty of about 1%, then, 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 then those models were kind of dead on arrival. So then specific mechanisms were invented to yield some additional suppressions for a new physics not to violate this bound. In fact, what's equally interesting that there's a parameter called epsilon K which is CP violation in KK biomixing, and we'll talk about later what that is. The difference in the case of epsilon K is that the dominant contribution comes from terms that go like the top, uh, that goes with the top contribution. So it goes like VTD, VTS square. So in some sense, epsilon CP violation in the K on sector is even more suppressed than just delta MK and generically has sensitivity to higher mass scales. And the point is not that we can necessarily precisely calculate delta MK in the standard model. If you take the state of the art calculations, 
from lattice QCD, there is still a long distance contribution here. And all we know is that the standard model can account probably within a 30, 40% uncertainty for this observed value of delta mk. So we don't need to calculate, be able to calculate this thing very precisely. It can still give us extremely strong bounds on new physics. And again, that will be a general question, just like you heard from Michelangelo that quite often the issue is, what are the, well, which are the processes where hadronic physics is tractable, where we can understand strong interaction physics so that we can learn about you know, beyond standard model phenomena that we really want to discover and understand and study if, uh, if, if it exists within the reach of uh, future experiments, then one of the key, quick, key questions in flavor physics will certainly be in which cases can we understand strong interaction physics and in which cases does strong interaction physics give you some uncertainties which are insurmountable. And, 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 and it for, in some cases it does forbid learning about beyond standard model phenomena. So, so there is CP violation, which can sometimes be even more, uh, sensitive to higher scales. And of course, the ultimate example of uh, whatever the standard model or what we call now sort of the minimal uh, extension of the standard model consistent with neutrino masses is that if you look at flavor changing uh, neutral currents, so for example interactions like mu to e gamma, then since uh, the discovery of neutrino masses and neutrino oscillations, we know that whichever way you extend the standard model to accommodate neutrino masses, there is contribution to this process uh, coming from one loop diagrams, which now, so if you ask what is this, then again, in the minimal extensions of the standard model to, to, to accommodate neutrino masses, this decay rate will have suppressions by neutrino mass square over MW square factors, which uh, is kind of one extreme case of, of fermion masses suppressing some decay rates. And in that case, sort of the, the predictions beyond, uh, without assuming additional new physics, is that this rate would be something like the 10 to the minus 50 level. Again, because you get some huge suppression from some light fermion mass over the weak scale to some power. And, and, and probably I will get back to charge lepton flavor violation in some of the later lectures. So, any questions? Yes. This will certainly keep me awake. Uh, so you quoted a bound on this kind of gauge boson X that this G times mm, 2 TeV, 2 and 10 to the 3 TeV. So that bound seems to depend quite strongly on the choice of lambda QCD. And it was because uh, the expression depends on lambda cube, and you said that uh, uh, it can be chosen uh, 300 MeV or 700 MeV. So it actually very strongly depends on your choice of lambda QCD. So I want to know what exactly dictates your choice of lambda QCD. I mean, because if I assume 300 uh, MeV for lambda QCD, then the bound will come down to uh, one order of magnitude, maybe. So. Yeah, so certainly I, I, this argument is not precise at that level, so probably I should remove this two and just put here some order of one number. And if you change, so what I meant here by lambda QCD is that when you evaluate this matrix element, whatever, I'll say, and this is not a big work, so S by left, gamma mu, D left, then you get some hadronic physics parameters and the k-on mass, which has mass dimensions three, and we don't know a priori what that value is. So whether you put here 300 MeV or 700 MeV, I completely agree with you. It changes this answer by a factor of two or three, and that's kind of beyond the accuracy that I care about for this argument here. Well, I, I mean, what I really cared about is the 10 to the three TeV, 
And even if g is 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3, you are still probing TeV scale physics. Yeah, that's what I want to know, actually. So uh, can I put it there uh, 300 MeV, for example? So you are putting there 700 or 800 MeV. If I put, say, 300 MeV, then this is lambda cube. It enhances by a factor of 7 by 3 whole cube. No, it's only 3 half, right? Because it's mx square. I have taken one square root in between. So this scale goes like the 3 halves power of what I put here. Okay, yeah. So even if I put here a factor of 3 bigger, a 3 smaller scale, the answer will only change up or down by a factor of 4. And for the purposes of this, yeah, so you can change this by an order of magnitude, but not more. Okay, okay, thanks. Any other questions? So, so what do I want to do? So I, I want to give you some examples and some, some of the theoretical background to, to explain how flavor is sensitive to beyond standard model phenomena. It's certainly, and, 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 and again, there's no way to distinguish this from the fact of what it taught us about the standard model in the past. So, so sort of the, there will be some historical some historical aspects of, of, of developments of the standard model. In recent years, there were examples of uh, sort of, let's call them anomalies, that show up in experimental data that could be beyond standard model physics. And I will talk about a few examples where it, even, even anomalies which look like observables that have nothing to do with flavor physics, when you try to build some model around it that would explain it, then very often flavor will be a constraint on, 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 on the models that could accommodate some experimental data. So I think that there, there is a very strong case that whatever the LHC will find in the next run that we all hope to understand what the underlying physics is, flavor physics, in my opinion, will be important to under, understand what the new physics could be or what the new physics is not. And since I think one of the f things which has been fun in the last uh, 10 years or 20 years about, about this physics is that sort of the development experimentally and theoretically has gone hand in hand. There was a lot of data from the B factories at Slack and in Japan. Now there is the LHC experiments, of course, Atlas and CMS, and also LHCB, which is providing a wealth of information. There are new k on experiments, both in Japan and at CERN, that are turning on. So there is really an incredible uh, development. So, so there's the, the issue about experiments improving in some cases by a factor of 100, in some cases by a factor of 10,000. The 10,000 is the interesting case of mu to e conversion, where the current bounds are expected in the next round of experiments to be conducted at Fermilab and at uh, JPARC to improve by a factor of 10,000. And so this gives you access to distance scales or energy scales that could give rise to deep deviations from the, 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 the uh, current expectations, sort of an order of magnitude higher scale than what we have access today. And of course, whenever you can access an order of, higher, order of magnitude higher energy scale, that, that, that is quite exciting. So, and of course, there is the other issue that, that we really understand kind of surprisingly little, little about flavor of physics. That, so there is something that, uh, people call the standard model flavor problem. That we really have no idea why there are three generations. What gives rise to the hierarchical parameters that you will see in between the quark masses and the mixing angles? Why is it that the neutrino parameters that uh, Professor Smirnov talked about are, that do not appear to be similarly hierarchical? And, of course, in the context of the new physics, 
uh, I mean, whatever, I will hope to find new physics at the TEV scale. In many of the new physics models, there are new physics flavor problems. And when people talk about that, we usually refer to the fact that the hierarchy problem uh, indicates or, or, or suggests that there should be some new physics at the TEV scale so that we can understand the Higgs mass, why the Higgs mass is so light. And this scale seems to be substantially smaller than sort of what would be your natural expectation of uh, sort of the new physics flavor scale if you just look at bounds like this. So certainly you can, there are lots of ways to reduce this 10 to the 3 TeV to a TeV, but you have to do something so that it happens. It doesn't happen automatically. I wanted to say one more thing about the experimental improvement. So, because sort of this 10 to the 4 improvement is really an extreme case. But if you just look at LHCB and, and Bell 2, which is the upgrade of the Japanese uh, E plus E minus B factory, they will have a order of 50 times the data that they have gathered so far. And the scale of new physics that they are sensitive to, in that case, goes like the fourth root of the integrated luminosity. In that case, it's 50. And the fourth root of 50 happens to be some number like 2.7. So even sort of the most conservative way of how the energy scale that you are sensitive to or the distance scale that you are sensitive to by in the next round of experiments improves by a factor of several. So, so I think it's quite interesting because the experimental precision will improve a lot. There is, of course, a related set of questions. In which case can this, is the theoretical understanding good enough that you can make use of this improved experimental precision to really learn about short distance high energy physics rather than, rather than just QCD. And of course, sometimes people ask what are the expectations for the deviations from the standard model in all these measurements. And of course, on that, there is a differing set of opinions depending on what your favorite new physics model is. But I would say that sort of any deviation beyond the current limits are possible. There have certainly been a huge body of literature which has predicted bigger deviations than where the current bounds are right now. Um, one of the important messages that will come repeatedly in these lectures that so for example, here in KK biomixing, even though this looks like an extremely precise field, if you ask what is the bound on how much could new physics still contribute to the observed value of KK biomixing delta MK, then the answer is that we know that surprisingly poorly. So, so something like a 30, 40% new physics contribution to the measured value of delta MK from new physics is something that is certainly still allowed. And, and, and so, 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 so this will come back and it's going to be important that, that despite the fact that the, sometimes there are these highly precise measurements at the percent level or at the few percent level, when you ask how well do they constrain new physics, in many cases, new physics to these flavor changing interactions can still be 20, 30% of the standard model. So, so in some ways, it's a very precise field. In some ways, there is still room for large deviations. And that's interesting, I think. Any questions? So, so I wanted to what should you expect? I think that in the rest of today's lecture, I will talk about flavor and CP violation. Sorry for using abbreviations, but I write slowly. So flavor and CP violation in the standard model. I don't know how this will go until probably it will slip into the second part. Something uh, sort of constraining. new physics in, in mixing. 
So it, it will turn out that neutral mesons, so there are four neutral mesons, the K on, the D meson, and the B and the B sub S meson. So neutral meson mixing will, will play a very special role in this story. So I will explain how well we can constrain new physics in, in, in these neutral meson uh, systems. In the third lecture, I will probably talk about some of the sort of uh, strong interaction or QCD or effective field theory methods that will allow to understand some of this uh, hadronic physics. And uh, in my last lecture, I will talk about sort of flavor at the TeV scale, sort of whatever top quark, so sort of top flavor properties, uh, maybe leptons, so charge lepton flavor violation, maybe a little bit about Higgs, uh, maybe a little bit about supersymmetry and flavor, who knows. Um, is this font size okay from the back? So, so, you, uh, so I wasn't here yesterday, but I'm sure you heard or well, you know very well that there are several ways that we know that the standard model is incomplete. We certainly have very strong evidence, so I mean, it's, it's, it's beyond doubt that dark matter must exist, and we don't know what is the particle nature of uh, whatever makes up dark matter. Uh, we also don't know exactly how neutrino masses should be added to the standard model. And what I mean by that is that we don't know empirically whether neutrino masses violate or don't violate uh, uh, lepton number what people sometimes refer to as the Majorana or Dirac nature of neutrino mass. And there is also, a, I think, uh, an, 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 an equally strong argument with the baryon asymmetry of the universe that you may have heard about, that we know in the, in, in, in the current universe that if you look at sort of the baryon number, the ratio of uh, Whatever. You, you know that the, the, the world around us is made up mostly of baryons. The density of antibaryons is, is, is negligibly small. Ah, sorry. So I should have. So if you look at the number density of baryons minus the number density of antibaryons divided by the entropy density of the universe, then we know today that this is about 10 to the minus 10, and this is roughly a constant in the expanding universe. And what this means is that soon after the Big Bang, when the temperature was so high that quarks and anti-quarks were in thermal equilibrium, at the very beginning there was a corresponding, so, so, sorry, not at the very beginning, that's actually important, there was an asymmetry that formed in the early universe between the number of quarks and the, and the number of anti-quarks that later resulted in this baryon asymmetry. And it was Saharov who first formulated a, a set of three conditions. That is required to generate this baryon asymmetry. And if you if you wish, you could ask, well, if, if, if somehow. So the point is that, OK, so the, actually it's a little bit of a complicated story, because you could ask that somehow at the very beginning at the Big Bang, there could have been some asymmetric initial condition that formed more baryons than antibaryons. But the point is that if inflation happened, and there is a very strong evidence for inflation, then inflation would have washed out whatever asymmetry there was from the initial conditions. So the baryon asymmetry that we see now is presumably dynamically generated through the thermal evolution of the universe. And for that, 
to generate a Bellion asymmetry, you need Bellion number violating interactions. Uh, you need, because otherwise, obviously, there would be always equal number of Bellions and anti Bellions. You need C and CP violation. Because without that, you would always, uh, even in the presence of baryon number violation, without C and CP violation, you would still generate equal num number of particles and antiparticles. And you need deviation from thermal equi equilibrium. Uh, because, again, in thermal equilibrium, even in the presence of baryon number violation and C and CP violation, because of detailed balance, you would form, you wouldn't be able to generate an asymmetry. And the interesting thing is that within the standard model, you can actually do a calculation. You, all these three ingredients are present in the standard model, but you find that the that the prediction of the standard model is something like 10 orders of magnitude smaller than the observed baryon asymmetry in the universe. And so one of the conclusions of this is that to make this work, you need a stronger, so in, again, in the standard model, there are several problems why this doesn't work. One of them is that during the electroweak phase transition, the deviation from thermal equilibrium is too small. And that could be fixed, for example, by a more complicated Higgs sector or a low energy supersymmetry or anything. I mean, not anything, but many new physics scenarios. And also, you need stronger CP violation. So these considerations give a very strong reason that very likely there has to be CP violation beyond the standard model. And, and that, of course, is a, is a strong reason to look for a CP violation beyond the standard model. Uh, interestingly enough, if you take the standard model, there are several places where CP violation could occur. It can occur in the quark sector that we'll talk about uh, throughout these lectures. And there is one such parameter that is an observed source of CP violation. It can also occur in, 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 in the QCD Lagrangian itself. If, 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 if the QCD Lagrangian contained a term which goes like F mu nu, F mu nu, dual, that such a term would violate uh, CP. It would give rise to, for example, electric dipole moment. So this is, this is a term that uh, usually, it's written as its coefficient is parameterized as uh, theta QCD times, I guess, 16 or 32 pi square, which I always forget, but someone will correct me. So if theta QCD were non-zero, that could give rise to, for example, electric dipole moments for the neutron, on which there are extremely strong constraints. And we know that this parameter for reasons that we don't understand, but there are plausible theories for it, and you'll hear about some of them next week, it has to be smaller than something like 10 to the minus 10. And since the neutrino masses that was discovered in 1998 or so, we know that there could also be CP violation in the neutrino sector, and that is something that we have not found yet. But But, but, but of course, the, so all these reasons, I, I, th I think I saw a strong motivation to, to, to look for, for additional sources of CP violation beyond what we have seen so far. Yes? The universe is what? The universe is the energy of the scale. The deviation from the surface is 
What is the deviation of characterization of some process and some modification? Yes, so some. I'm not sure I precisely understand the question about. Uh, maybe I should give you back the microphone. So. So, so there has to be some process which gets out of thermal equilibrium during the thermal evolution of the universe. I, I can't understand what is, what is the for Ah, so for example, so for example in, in leptogenesis models, so for, for example like something like supercooling. So if you, if you have some What's, what's a good explanation for this? If, uh, well, it's a property of... No, no, no. So it's it's certainly for some process where where these uh, phenomena can take place. So you're right that in in the case of electroweak baryogenesis, the question is whether the electroweak phase transition, when the Higgs acquires a vacuum expectation value, is that a second order phase transition? Is that a first order phase transition? And how the, the how how that phase transition takes place. So yes, it is, de it, it is dependent on the, on the process in that sense. Maybe I still don't understand your question. I can see this course that the first two conditions can be the last one, but the process depends. So the second one can be the Well, it's related to, to the, it's related to some interaction that would generate. So for, for example, in the context of the standard model, it would give you some constraints on the Higgs mass. That if the Higgs mass were lighter than what it is experimentally, is, do I get it backwards or not? I think that the Higgs mass would have to be substantially lighter in the standard model to make the electroweak phase transition first order so that some electroweak process during that phase transition can, can produce a baryon asymmetry. So, so in, the, in the context of the standard model, with electroweak baryogenesis, it's a, it, 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 it can be written as a constraint on the Higgs mass. So it's in that sense that, and if you have some beyond standard model scenario, again, uh, looking at which processes remain in thermal equilibrium and how quickly certain processes occur at, at, at a certain energy scale get, that can give you constraints on parameters of, 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 of a model. So, okay, maybe we should continue afterwards. Yes. Uh, related to uh, non-perturbative effects, because uh, uh, always we see uh, f dot f no f uh, f dual dual of f. Um, it's a dimension for a term that you can write down, so you should write down, and and. So sorry, in electromagnetism, if you only had u1, then you, you can show that that term is irrelevant. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a boundary term. It's, 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 it's in the electroweak theory that 
that there are physical consequences of that term. So just in QED, it would be inconsequential. Uh, uh, any relation between this term and uh, instantons and uh, non perturbative objects? There are possible, uh, I mean, so one of the explanations for this term, why the term is, 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 is dynamically so small, is, 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 is for example, if, if, if there is an axion. And there will be a whole set of lectures next week on, on, on axions. So I'm sure that this will be explained better next week. Someone else uh, had a question. Yeah, my question's related to that. I'm just wondering why you've listed that as uh, CP violation beyond the standard model, since that term is a generic feature of the standard model. Yeah, so model. I, 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 I shouldn't say beyond the standard model. I, uh, what, what, I, what I meant to I, I would say that that's a part of the standard model, and we just don't understand why the coefficient is so small. So I don't, I don't know what the standard model is anymore with neutrino masses, because we don't know whether the right-handed uh, light neutrinos or not, and to me that's an experimental question. There is a very strong prejudice that in, among most theorists, including myself, that uh, neutrino masses come from a dimension five term, and it's a Majorana mass, but we don't know it empirically. So, but yeah, I would certainly say that that term is a part of the standard model because we can write it down, and uh, we just don't understand why the coefficient is so small. Anyone else? Yes. Excuse me, how much uh, the CP violation phase is needed for uh, explain uh, this baryon asymmetry? So, in the quark sector, in the standard model, there is no phase, even if it's maximal phase, I mean, it's not enough. So the, the problem is that in the standard model, from the CP violation that occurs in the quark sector, the, the effect, its consequence for the baryon asymmetry is not only related to the CKM parameters and like the sign of the CP violating phase, but you also get a product of the mass, quark mass square differences. So what suppresses the standard model so badly is not really the smallness of CP violation, but that it comes uh, in a combination with the quark mass square differences, which are much smaller for most of the quark mass square differences than the electroweak scale. And the origin of that you, you can understand because we'll come back to it that in the two generation standard model there would be no CP violation. So what, what's called the Yarskog invariant, if that's familiar to you, that contains all the, separately all the three up-type quark mass square differences and the three down-type quark mass square differences. And if any of those two were, any of those, maybe I can write it down. If any of those were zero, then the standard model quark sector would not have CP violation. And so it's really these quark mass square differences which make the answer extremely small because what is in the denominator is, is, is the MW square at the weak scale. And, and it's the smallness of uh, the quark masses in this invariant, which make the answer so tiny. Yeah, in, in the standard model, it, uh, it's not enough. But, uh, but uh, how much is enough for, for, the, uh, for uh, produce this asymmetry? So I'm not an expert on that question. I think that usually the standard model is quoted to give less than 10 to the minus 20. So it's like 10 orders of magnitude too small. And and, and the details depend on lots of things that would lead us to some direction that probably some of you know more about than I. Any other questions? So, so, okay, so in the standard model we have left-handed uh, so, uh, left quark doublets 
which go like under SU3, it's a triplet, SU2 doublet, and it has a hypercharge 1,6. We have right-handed coax singlets, which are SU3 triplets, singlets under SU2, and have hypercharge two-thirds. Right-handed singlets, which have three, one, minus a third. Lepton doublets, which are one, two, minus a half. And the right-handed lepton singlets, which are one, one, minus one. And so for most of these lectures, I will ignore the lepton sector. But so, so to me, the definition of flavor physics, or what is flavor physics, is basically any interaction that distinguishes between the three generations of these fermion representations. So why, 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 why three fermion representations? And, and what, what makes the first and the second and the third generation different? And of course, we know that in the standard model, everything comes from the Yukawa couplings of the fermions to the Higgs field. So there is the down quark Yukawa couplings, which couples Q bar to the Higgs field to DIJ, and there is the up quark Q covers, which couple the left handed quarks to phi tilde, which is something like I to to phi conjugate, uh, uh, what? To UIJ, and then for the lepton. Sorry, so it's a coupling between this left-handed doublet. So it's always coupling a doublet to a singlet with the Higgs field. And so these Yukawa matrices are some three by three complex matrices, which are completely arbitrary as far as we know. And after electrobic symmetry breaking, So this uh, doublet uh, field, this complex doublet field acquires a vacuum expectation value, and you get mass terms Well, the down quark mass terms will have a matrix which is just coming from the web, the Higgs web times these Yukawa matrices. And now this couples to the left-handed and the right-handed down quarks. And there is similarly a term for the up quarks. And again, these are still arbitrary three by three complex matrices. And as uh, you may know, any three by three complex matrix can be diagonalized by multiplying it from both the left and right by some unitary matrices. So I'm going to insert the unit matrix here, written in some funny form, VDR dagger, VDR, and here VDL dagger, VDL. So these Vs are just some uh, unitary matrices. So this is the identity, and this is the identity. And they are chosen such that if I look at this three, then this is a diagonal, a dia diagonal matrix, which is just M, D, M, S, M, B. And if, you can, and if you figure out what are these unitary rotations, the, these two unitary matrices that diagonalize the mass matrix, then by definition, these transformations on the left-handed down quarks and the right-handed down quarks will give you the mass eigenstates for, for the quarks. And similarly, 
For the uptype works, there is, this is another three by three matrix, so it's a two unitary matrices from left and right that can diag diagonalize that matrix, and a priori those unitary rotations have nothing to do with, with, what diag with, with the matrices that diagonalize the down quark mass matrix, so this is VUL, Degel, VUL, and VDL, Degel, VDL. So again, VUL times MU times VDL, Degel is the di diagonal matrix for the up quark, so M up, M chime, M top, and, and VDL times UIJ is the mass eigenstates, sorry, the, is the mass eigenbasis for the, for the up quarks. And the point is that, uh, yeah, so for example, I was not writing, I should have some index on these things because these are the weak interaction eigenstates and these are the mass eigenstates. But what you can see is that uh, this left-handed quark doublet contained an up quark, a left-handed up quark and a left-handed down quark. And you see that the diagonalizing matrix for the, uh, for the left-handed up quark and the left-handed down quark is just two matrix which are unrelated to one another. So this field, QL, which was an SU2 doublet, UL and DL, in the weak interaction basis. Now when you diagonalize the mass matrix for, for, for the quarks, then the, you have to, use differ, have to apply different uh, unitary rotations for the UL and the DL guys, which were part of the same SU2 doublet. And so the UL, the left-handed up quark is diagonalized by VUL Degel. So I pull that out. And what I'm left with, so I should put, uh, so these are interaction eigens, the weak interaction eigenstates. I should have put uh, an upper index I on all of these for weak interaction eigenstates. I'm sorry for being sloppy. And here we get a VUL VDL Degel times yeah so I want this to be IJ this is JK I guess this must be J then. Okay, good. So, so it's it's, it's kind of, so it's really kind of a simple story because these mass matrices are, are diagonalized by by different uh, unitary rotations for each of these fields. We end up with sort of this misalignment that when we go to the mass eigenstates for the up and the down quarks, the left-handed up and down quarks, then we pick up this unitary matrix that, that, that gives you a misalignment that, 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 that in the mass basis, the, the, the SU2 doublet field will not only contain an up quark, but it will contain a linear combination of all the down quarks. And so it's really this matrix, which is usually referred to as the CKM matrix. And since it's the product of uh, a unitary matrix and uh, two unitary matrices. This matrix is unitary as well. And what it tells you is that the weak interaction, which started out, if you just write down the kinetic terms in the, in the, in the weak interaction basis, uh, weak interaction eigenbasis, it was, uh, so the W in this basis couples diagonally to the quarks. After you go to the mass eigenbasis, which really tells you what are the states, the, what are the propagating degrees of freedom, which have a well-defined uh, uh, time evolution, 
then now the W no longer couples just the same generation up and down quarks, but it couples uh, an up quark to a linear combination of the other three down quarks. So, so the physics of this is that you get what's called a charge current weak interaction, an interaction of a W plus with, so for example, if you produce here U I, then this guy can be any of the D, of the three different kind of down quarks, and the coupling is going to be G2, the V coupling, times the CKM matrix IJ. And it just comes from the fact that it's different, uh, that, 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 that the mass matrices are diag diagonalized by different transformations for the up and the down quarks. And so an important property of this is that you are getting, that you get this, the, 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 the W interactions change the quark flavor. At the same time, when you look at uh, the interactions of the Z boson, Uh, what else did I want to say? So you can go through this diagonalization because the, so, so the interactions of the Z boson remain flavor diagonal, so they only couple to whatever ULI to ULI, or DLI, to DLI, whatever, left or right. And sorry, just one second. So you get charge current interactions at three level. The Z remains a flavor the coupling to just uh, the same uh, quark anti quark pairs without any what's called flavor changing neutral currents. And if you want to, uh, so for example, if you want to have some decay, say K long to mu plus mu minus which was actually historically important because that's really, so the, there was a puzzle in the late 60s that K long to mu plus mu minus was uh, not yet seen experimentally and the theoretical calculations uh, uh, would have predicted it to be seen in, in, uh, at that time we only knew about, people only knew about three quarks, the up, down and the strange and So if you, if you want to do this kind of flavor changing, if you want to get this kind of flavor changing neutral currents, then you need to have what's called a second order weak interaction. So you have to have two electroweak gauge bosons involved because you cannot get such a, a flavor changing neutral current at three level in the standard model. And it's kind of the same story for K long to mu mu or KK by mixing that we started with over there that I mean, for, from this point of view, it doesn't matter. So, so here you are changing a down type quark to another down type, down type quark. That's why it's called a neutral current. And, and these type of interactions in the standard model only occur as a, as, as a second order process with, the, with, 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 with two at, at, at the loop level, not, not, not at tree level. Uh, there's another, so there's an important aspect of this. So here, in all these loop diagrams, you can have 
three type of internal quarks. And if you calculate this amplitude, it's going to look like, what else can it be, as a sum of uh, three terms. So VUS, VUD star times some function of M up plus V uh, VCS, VCD star times some function of M chime for the chime piece. And the third term, the third term is VTS, VTD star times some function of M top. So this is, I, I haven't really computed anything, I just denoted this loop integral. The only difference between these processes, is, between these diagrams, is the identity of uh, the internal quark in this diagram. So there is some dependence on, 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 on the quark masses. And you can see immediately that because the CKM matrix, so it was VUL, VDL, Degel, so what is, so you, you see immediately that, uh, that uh, VCKM times VCKM Degel, that's also the unit matrix because it's nothing else but VUL, VDL Degel times VDL, VUL Degel. So, so this is one and therefore that times that is also one. So because, the CKM matrix is, unit, uh, is, is unitary, that tells you that in the limit of when the quark mass is, if, if the quark mass is all vanished, then you would have VUS, VUD, Degel. So let me pull out F of zero symbolically, times VCS, VCD, Degel, plus VTS, VTD Degel uh, plus there will be terms that go like so what I'm imagining is just Taylor expanding these uh, functions of the quark masses about zero and you see that the leading term, so the first term, which uh, the, the quark mass independent term, gives me this sum of CKM matrices, which has to vanish because the CKM matrix is unitary. So then the next terms, which go like the, the uptype quark mass squares, those will be the leading terms, which are non-zero, but these will always be when you write down, the, 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 the result will always give you terms which go like some mi square minus mj square over the weak scale square because, these are, because the dimensionality of the answer doesn't change and uh, I, you have to go to second order in the quark masses to get a non-zero answer. So, so any flavor changing neutral current process in the standard model is proportional to some quark mass square difference over the weak scale. And of course you see that there is an important caveat that when, so in processes where the top quark can play an important role, then this is not a suppression factor at all for, 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 for processes where the top quark dominates, but for processes where the first two generation dominate, then these type of factors usually get, uh, give you a very severe suppression, like in the case of KK by mixing that we uh, started out with. So, so you see that this flavor changing neutral currents really in some sense very directly probe the differences between the three generations and, and they are always uh, suppressed except when the top work can dominate some particular process. So, so this will be relevant for many processes in, in, the, in the B meson sector and there are a few cases in K on the case where 
where the top work pl diagram plays the dominant role. In the case of uh, so k long to mu mu is actually an interesting uh, case because it's a combination, in fact, of the top diagram and, and long distance contributions that uh, determine the answer. So, so, so let me say a little bit more about the CKM matrix before we finish. So it's obviously a three by three matrix. And I'm not going to write it out. Once we know what are in the corners, that's all I can remember. And And so basically, this, so, so this is a three by three complex matrix, which is unitary. And, 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 and it's a very different set of experiments that can give you information on the magnitudes and the phases of, uh, of, 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 this, of, of, of these nine complex numbers. Um, we know empirically that in the, so this, this ma mixing matrix in the quark sector has an approximately diagonal structure so that the entries, so, so the, the, the W interaction is almost flavor diagonal, but not quite. And so it is a useful parametrization that was introduced by uh, Lincoln Wolfenstein to, to parametrize this matrix by by, by, by four parameters, oh, I should, I should have said it before. So, so a three by three unitary matrix in general depends on nine parameters, right? Three mixing angles and six phases. And you can show in lots of different ways we can talk about it uh, afterwards, or you can ask me, that five of these phases can be removed in the quark sector. So there is one complex phase and three real mixing angles that parameterize the, the, this mixing matrix. And just, so the magnitudes of these uh, elements are physical quantities. Their, their phases depend on conventions. And, and just to keep track of uh, the order of magnitude of, uh, of the different terms, so lambda c is usually called the Kabibo, well, it's actually, so lambda c is sine theta Kabibo, which is something like 0 0.225 or so. And, and usually it is quite useful that you can put the CP violating phases into this smallest, uh, f uh, whatever, farthest of diagonal entries of the CKM matrix. And so for many processes, it is actually useful to think about just v, VUB and VTD to carry a complex CP violating phase. But you should remember that to get something phase convention independent that is CP violating, the result always has to depend on four CKM elements. You cannot have a CP viol any CP violating uh, physical quantity has to depend on four CKM elements. It cannot depend on few will. And of course, because this is a unitary matrix, if you take the scalar product of uh, any two rows, i and j, that has to give you delta ij. Similarly, the, the, the dot product of uh, column nine 
and, and, and two different columns have to give you delta ij. Um, and what do I want to do in the next five minutes? I saw that I would get a lot fired also. So, so, so let me just say one more thing that, uh, of course, the interesting question is not measuring these elements, whatever these parameters. They are just some couplings in the, in, in, in the standard model Lagrangian. The real question is how can you do measurements which test this structure or are sensitive to, to beyond standard model phenomena? And because there is really a lot of different measurements which are relevant for answering this question. It has sort of become a useful language to get a graphical representation of, of, of constraints on, on the CKM matrix that is called the unitarity triangle. And I, it, it's, it's kind of, uh, you should really think about it as As, 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 as a way to compare lots of independent constraints on the CKM matrix. So what it comes from is taking the scalar product of the first column and the, and the last column. So So one of these unitarity relations tell you that VUD times VUB conjugate plus VCD times VCB conjugate plus uh, VTD times VTB conjugate has to be equal to zero. And this, uh, so these are the sum of three complex numbers adding up to zero. That is sum that you can represent as a sum of three vectors adding up to zero. That's also called a triangle. And uh, it is conventional for entirely historical reasons. So 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people had a fairly good idea of what is the magnitude of this term. <coughs> and therefore, it has become customary to take this relation and divide out by this term. <coughs> so then you get another relation, which is 1. And now you can draw this, this triangle, but this is 0, 0. This is 1, 0. And so this is the VTD, VTB. Side, and this is this. And, it, uh, and, and, and in that parametrization, the coordinates of the apex of this triangle is rho and eta. And I guess uh, we'll get to it only tomorrow that uh, so, 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 so yeah, so instead of me trying to draw all these constraints, there is a sort of the state of the art plot. And, 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 and we'll just go through a few of these measurements. So that's what I, why I meant that, that the unitarity triangle is really just a language to compare different constraints because you can do measurements of the sides of this triangle using both three level processes. And for some of the measurements, you can do loop level processes. So the consistency of those can test possible new physics contributions in, 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 in processes which in the standard model only occur in loop diagrams. And by studying CP violating phenomena, so this angle is usually labeled as gamma, alpha, beta, 
by studying CP violating observables, one can also get direct information on the angles of this triangle. In fact, one can do different measurements of the same angle, which is sensitive to new physics, and we'll see some examples of this uh, tomorrow or on Thursday. So probably I should stop. Um, and continue from here next time. So what do I want to say? So, OK, so, so just to talk about this for a minute. So, so the most important constraints, so that uh, if you haven't seen this before, so, so there are direct measurements, for example, of, uh, of this angle beta, which is this angle. And we'll go through how, why that is so precise and how can that be independent of uh, QCD effects to an extremely good accuracy tomorrow. There are also some measurements of the angle gamma, which is going to be very important, partly because so all, of the, all, all the angles, alpha and beta, are measured in processes which are loop processes in the standard model. They involve BV by mixing. Gamma is special because it can be measured in three-level processes. And similarly, on the, when, you measure, when, when people measure the sides of this triangle, they can be measured from processes involving BB by mixing or processes such as semi-leptonic decays, where new physics is very unlikely to influence the standard model results. So you see that the, the complexity of this is in the fact that you are really putting a lot of measurements. Some of them are insensitive to new physics. Some of them are sensitive to new physics, and you are trying to compare whether they give a consistent determination of standard model parameters, or whether there is some tension between them which could indicate the presence of new physics or, or, or our lack of understanding of something that we thought we understood. But basically, this is sort of the, one of the flagship, flagship plots of the, of, 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 of the last 10 years of B-factory progress. And what I will explain next time is that even though this plot looks like, you know, like a dozen measurements or something like eight, nine measurements having an extremely good consistency, just like where we started in the K-on sector, despite the fact that the very consistent results, if you assume the standard model from the beginning, if you allow for a possible new physics, for example, in BV biomixing, then these, then the constraints on the new physics parameters are actually much weaker. And sort of the conclusion will be that also in PV biomixing, just like in KK biomixing, we can still have 20, 30 percent of the standard model contribution that, that could come from, from new physics processes. So, so, I, so, so we'll talk about uh, neutral meson mixing and CP violation tomorrow. And, 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 and we'll see how far I can get tomorrow.